Today we're lucky to feature Jules Pfeiffer. Here are just a few highlights from his long and illustrious career. As a teenager, he apprenticed under Will Eisner, one of the most important cartoonists of the 20th century and the guy who helped pioneer the quote-unquote graphic novel. He put out decades of amazing comic strips at the Village Voice and other locations. He's written plays, drawn self-contained graphic novels, illustrated the Phantom Tollbooth, and is credited as the scriptwriter for Robert Altman's cult classic, Popeye. His new graphic novel is The Ghost Script, the finale of his trilogy that includes Kill My Mother and Cousin Joseph. It's an unabashedly political dive into the world of the Hollywood blacklist. It is also a riff on newspaper strips and serials he loved as a kid. Ladies and gentlemen, Jules Pfeiffer. I move very slowly at this age. <laughs> Get used to it. <sighs> I'm going to be 90 in January. <laughs> so uh, I think I'm still beginning. Uh, it's lovely to be here. I love coming to this store. I love the audiences. I love the atmosphere. Uh, I love the, the, just the general feeling of people who love books, who love ideas, who want to talk, who want to engage. And, um, and it makes me happy that, that I keep getting invited back. It makes me even happier that I keep giving them a reason for being invited back. <laughs> the reason today that brings us here, hello, Jewel. <laughs> there is Jules Stoddard, ladies and gentlemen, a great human being and a, and a bookseller of renown. Uh, the, uh, I started writing, well, this is a little warm. Uh, excuse me. I usually keep on the jacket so it's because I think it holds me up, but <laughs> that, that may be an illusion. Um, I started the graphic novel series, but that began with Kill My Mother, <coughs> truly because of age. I mean, that I found I had moved out of New York. I was living on Long Island, living out in the Hamptons where I had been, uh, I chose the Hamptons because I had te been teaching a writing class called Humor and Truth out at Stony Brook Southampton University, or college, not a university, and, and, um, and made friends there and liked the people there, and, um, and it was congenial. And when I couldn't take the fact that New York was so uncongenial, and that the places that I wanted to go, which I used to go to by walking and took me five or seven or eight minutes, now took me 45 minutes and sometimes I never made it, that, that all New York did was remind me of my mortality and tell me that I didn't have much time left. Uh, and when I moved out to the Hamptons, I could, it helped me redefine my mortality so that I could make up how much time I had left. They couldn't tell me anymore. And I found that I could kind of redefine time, but also I had to redefine work because I couldn't write plays anymore. They took place in New York. And also, as a problem of age, your hearing goes. And it's just dumb to write a play you can't hear in rehearsal. <laughs> You can't really help anybody out that way. And, and they look at you puzzled when you answer a question that nobody asked. So, and there was a certain amount of doing that. So I, I had to, out in the Hamptons, I had to figure out what am I going you know, to write now? What am I going to draw now? What shall I do now? And I started fiddling around with um, noir for no particular reason I was conscious at the time, although I realized after that it was something that was kind of faded uh, in terms of the world we live in, the world I was living in. The, uh, when I was a kid growing up 
in the Bronx during the Great Depression. I was born in 1920, January 1929. The Depression started in October 1929. I had very little to do with that. Uh, and by the way, Popeye, the great character Popeye by Elsie Chris Le Cigar began, he, Popeye was born in, 1970, in 1929. We, Popeye and I share a birthday, and, and, um, uh, and we are what we are. Um, but I, uh, the thing about the, the uh, uh, comics when I loved them as a kid, there were the adventure strips like Terry and the Pirates and the adventure and, and Will Eisen is a Spirit. There were these wonderful action stuff that got, I mean, they, they made a whole new world for me as a little boy, four or five in the Bronx during the years of the Great Depression. And as I got older and started getting into my own work, I realized that my drawing style was antithetical to doing that kind of work. That's not the work I, I knew how to draw. I couldn't handle the brush like those car the, the cartoonists who drew those strips did. I couldn't handle the form. And the more I tried, the more embarrassing it looked like. The, the, and so I, I had to abandon it and moved more in the direction of humor, and, um, which I also liked. But my real dream was these adventure cartoons, and, and, uh, uh, which were moving out of commercial feasibility anyway, so that all of that was you know, all dying off. But, uh, so for years, I met, you know, as, as you know, I concentrated on the kind of cartoons that made my reputation the village voice, which were drawn very simply and very directly because the whole point of those drawings was a kind of sleight of hand to seduce the reader to go to from panel one to panel two to you to the end where I hit them with the snowball, you know, and, and um, we, where I try to bring the reader a degree of consciousness on social issues, political issues, relationships, whatever was, whatever was on my mind. And because it was always a contra often always a cont contrarian view um, and, and, uh, and something they did not often get, I had to bring them along gently. It's 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 a con act, and and um, and I realized that if you if you dress it up with fancy drawing, or if you dress it up with angle shots, you dress it up with shadows, and then the reader you you can't con the reader. Just have a deceptive, almost thermal like simplicity to each panel, and then you hit them with panel eight, and they say, "Oh my God!" <laughs> and 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 and. Uh, and you've caught them and, and you've given them perhaps a thought that you wanted to that they didn't have before, a way of looking at something. So for years I did that, but the drawing, uh, while it worked, was essentially passive and was secondary to the con of getting the reader to go from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven to the pow. When I got, when I gave up the strip, or uh, they just lost faith in the efficacy of the strip because I didn't think after 40 years I was doing any good at all except repeating myself. And I thought I was irritating the reader as much as I was irritating, you know, irritated by the politics of the time and that I was becoming a nag. So I thought it was better that I get out of that game. And that's when I moved into children's books, which and I'm, I've been down here talking about a number of my children's books with great happiness. And children's books opened up a whole new world for me, and a whole new world of looking at drawing and illustration. And uh, so that by the time I got to noir and thinking about that, it seemed a kind of natural evolvement going from the Pfeiffer strip to kids' books, out of theater. Um, but the kids' books had a different kind of drawing and a different kind of reality into... Uh, the world that took me back to Milton Kniff and Will Eisner. Noir was that thing that all of us of a certain age uh, became addicted to, uh, an addiction it really was. In uh, the 40s, it was based on the writings in the 20s, 30s, and 40s by most notably writers like Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler. And there were a few others, but those were the two heavyweights. 
And but the, but what really gave them the huge biggest clout was right after the war, right after World War Two, or just toward the end of World War Two. These movies started coming out. John Huston did the Maltese Falcon. Um, uh, the Postman Always Rings Twice uh, 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 <laughs> with Lana Turner and John Garfield. A whole series of movies. Uh, and, and, and the Robert, Mitchum, Robert Ryan betrayal movies. That, that, that we had come out of World War II more victorious than any country in the world, less harmed. We took less, uh, we, we, she, uh, less damage. We took no internal damage. Nobody... There was, there was no Twin Tower attack to, you know, in, on the American soil in World War II. We came out of it um, in one piece. And suddenly overnight there was the GI Bill and people who, who, whose families for generation were working class or, you know, and, and living hard scrabble lives went to uh, um, college on the GI Bill and they had families and they built homes. They moved into their own homes for the first time, and they had dishwashers and washing machines, and they had accoutrements, and they had they had stuff. They had car, and suddenly they had we had a middle class in this country before any other country had a extensive middle class, and more more dream. I mean, the American dream, which had always been a dream, seemed to become a reality for so many people, and there seemed to be every reason in the world to be confident and happy and ebullient. And uh, and and one saw that in the result in result of as a result of some of the culture, that the Hollywood musicals, the MGM musicals in particular, and uh, 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 and some of the comedies and all of that. But at the sun, suddenly, these betrayal movie, the, the movies started happening, where GIs would come back, uh, Robert Mitchum would come back from the war and discover that his best friend Robert Ryan had betrayed him. Everybody had betrayed everybody else. Suddenly, there was a theme of people coming home, and there was a dark side. And where did the dark side to? And at the same time that people were being betrayed, and things weren't turning out the way they were supposed to, and your best friend had stolen your best girl, and you were being screwed all over the place. At the same time, there were creatures from other planets invading us. <laughs> and they were doing terrible things. They were plotting against us. And it was fascinating where, what gave us the need and the, for this kind of paranoia. This because there, were, there didn't seem to be any overt threat. Uh, uh, the only way the Russians could truly attack us because they had no delivery session, uh, uh, a system was to mail a bomb to us. But, but uh, and so that, that began to interest and fascinate me. And uh, why noir and the great siege of noir that happened for many years and then finally went out of fashion, but why that had become such a big deal uh, in our time and in our culture. And when I started thinking in terms of a graphic novel, series of graphic novels based on noir, I wanted to comment on the time I lived in, on the time I grew to maturity, and in the world I lived in, which kind of, in, a, in, in a way of explaining not just where we were today, because I wasn't thinking in those terms, but just kind of explaining to myself how I had come to have the ideas I had over the years and what helped me grow them and how they related to the present time and the present place. Uh, I understood that if I had to try to do a graphic novel about uh, the year 2000, no, 2010 or two, I wouldn't know where to begin because I don't know the music, I don't know the culture, I don't know the cars, I don't know the, I mean, and I have no feeling for it. I have no affinity for it. But put me in 1929 and I can go crazy. And so I started fooling around, uh, not knowing where I was going, but the need to go somewhere, the need to find some work for myself, uh, in a little cottage I had rented in Southampton uh, with, a do with my dog and my cat, and, um, and fiddled around writing 
uh, the story and wrote and rewrote and and and, and got a set of characters and a private eye and and threw things around and just thought you know, got, got a kind of story idea. When I finally wrote what I considered a script, a scenario, it was in the kind of form of a screenplay where I had it all typed up and there would be uh, a description of the action, what one would see on the page as opposed to on the screen and what the dialogue would be. And I took it to my agent who sent it to a publisher and he loved it. And I said, but we have to find an artist for it because I can't draw in that style. And he said, you're crazy. You can't have a book by you that's a graphic novel and not you haven't you not draw it. Uh, and I said, I don't know how to draw in that style. And he said, go home and try. <laughs> well, I found out when I went home and tried that uh, once I took a trip to an art store, I discovered that they had all sorts of new pens and brush pens that were the equivalent of the brush strokes that I couldn't master when I was a kid, but these I could use like a pencil. And so I learned, you know, I started fooling around and, and, and did some sample pages. And I gave them three sample pages. They loved the sample pages. And suddenly I was under contract to do this, to kill my mother. And I had no intention of being the artist on it. But now I was trapped into doing it. And that first book, which I did out in Southampton, was a god-awful but wonderful experience because, uh, first of all, I knew that I was unqualified for this work. And I knew that uh, there was no way I could fake my way through this. And I, uh, first of all, I went out and bought a 65-inch television set and played back, recorded all the old Turner Classic movies from the period that I was covering um, in Kill My Mother and then had the pictures on the screen. Uh, I pushed the pause button and had the, 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 the atmosphere that was in these movies directed by Houston and Hawks and, uh, and Edward Demetriuk and others, these angle shots and all that, that they'd all posed for me sti as stills. And I drew off the screen, I swiped stuff and you know, got notes and did all of that and, so that I understood what the movies did and uh, build up confidence in myself, my ability to do that. And, the more, and as I stole things, I got ideas on how to illustrate the book. I would do layouts, then I would do a page. I would finish the page. I think I got away with it. I'd go to bed with a nervous breakdown, could get back the next day and start another day and another nervous breakdown. They were, the book was 147 pages and 147 nervous breakdowns because I never, ever believed that I was really qualified to do this. And until the book came out, I still didn't believe it. And the book, the reaction to the book made me almost believe it. But by this time, whether I believed it or not, I was in love. I was in love with the form. I knew this is how I wanted to spend the rest of my days, just doing this kind of stuff. Because it took me back to the comic books of Kniff and Eisner that I had loved as a kid. It took me back to what I really wanted to do, but was unqualified to do when I was seven and eight and nine. And now I was doing it in my 80s, moving in on 90s, and I was be finally becoming not that crappy satirical cartoon of strong overthrowing the government, to what end, I ask you, uh, toward no end, <laughs> toward Donald Trump. Uh, and I was doing the kind of comics I wanted to do from the time I was a baby. So uh, now, sadly, with... The ghost script, is, it, I can't do any more noir because this is the end of that, that, that trilogy. So I'm about to embark on an idea for uh, doing a, a series uh, of books for middle-level readers, still using the graphic novel form because that's the only way I want to work from now on. And, uh, uh, and that's all I've got to say about all of this part of my life. If, if, does anybody have a question? Or more important, does anybody have an answer? <laughs> uh, it's a microphone. Don't be afraid of it. Mr. Pfeiffer, thank you. Thank you very much for being here. 
Um, um, one thing that I was wondering is, is during your career, did you have the opportunity to meet, to meet either Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or Senator Robert Kennedy? I, I never met Dr. King. I met Bobby Kennedy several times, a number of times. Out of one of those times, uh, when he was running, I did a cartoon that has gotten a lot of attention over the years. In uh, uh, it's done as a children's book uh, format, and uh, it's called the Bobby Twins. And it says these are the Bobby Twins, and there's a kind of primitive drawing of little two little Bobby Kennedys, and as if scrolled by a, a child. This is the good Bobby, and there's one Bobby, and then looking exactly like him, this is the bad Bobby. <laughs> and, uh, the, the, uh, and then I, uh, I don't remember the cartoon after all these years, but it was basically, the good Bobby is for civil rights. The bad Bobby appoints racist judges down south. He was the, the attorney general at the time. The good Bobby does this, he was still the attorney general. And so I was pointed to the, 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 the difference between the image of one Bobby Kennedy uh, that they that uh, he was running on uh, as a potential presidential candidate he hadn't declared yet I don't think and the reality of his, of of being the attorney general and being involved in a lot of dirty business um, and it ended with if you want if you uh, 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 if you want one Bobby to be your president, you have to be your, you have to vote for both, you know, you know, and, and end up that way. So, um, on the basis of that, I think it was that I got invited by Bobby Kennedy to breakfast for, <laughs> with him and a friend of mine named Bill Vannon, who was on his campaign staff, and a wonderful fellow, and uh, and another guy. Uh, who was on his staff. And Bobby was, these two guys were immense. And Bobby was sitting in the middle, Senator Kennedy, and very demure. And we'd be talking and having a conversation. And then he'd wisecrack to one of the guys. And this guy would say something, and he, he, kind of defending himself. And then he'd wisecrack to the other. And he would defend himself. And I re realized that Bobby was kind of playing off one of his aides against the other to show me how they would sing and dance for him, you know, and how he could get them hopping. And it was a kind of prom queen tower play, you know, that, that look, at, look at all the boys. And, and I was both amused and, and, and irritated by this because it just, uh, I didn't like that game. And, and, and didn't like that he was doing it for my, my benefit. And I was very um, down on, you know, I, I supported, until it turned out to be a terrible mistake, uh, uh, Gene McCarthy for president, and, um, and was against Kennedy. And, and it took me years to believe, as I finally do now, that Kennedy really could have made a change and really might have done something, but during the time of his life, I was not a fan. I mean, I saw great moments that he had done and very impressive things that I had done, but I saw some shabby things he had done too. And the shabby things during his lifetime uh, took prevalence over uh, the things I liked about him. I had friends linked with David Halberstam and uh, Jack Newfield, who were crazy about him, but I was never on that team. I only give long answers to questions. <laughs> so thank you for asking that. Anybody else want to ask any, uh, anything, and I'll go on with filibustering. <laughs> they, you know, the thing about me in politics over the years was, uh, and even now, uh, I mean, this book, The Ghost Script, essentially goes back to how I got into politics in the first place. Let me talk about that for a, a few minutes. That the thing that made me first polit political, well, it was my family. I had a sister who was a member of the Communist Party, and I wrote a play about her called The Bad Friend. Uh, and, uh, 
and she had all of these attractive young men from high school come to the house, and they would talk politics, and they would talk back and forth, and they were, they were very funny guys, and they they were, and, and and some of them were Reds, and some of them were just lefties, but they had an attitude and a wise guy attitude, to to their whole style that basically informed my youth and probably informs my adult years. I kind of stole it from them. Um, but, uh, but, but what, what happened with in, in, in the 40s, when I was still in high school, uh, was the blacklist in Hollywood. And now, why the blacklist became so important to me and why it became such a personal thing to me, I never understood because it had nothing at all to do with me. I had no ambition to ever write movies. I had no ambition to be a writer. I, my older sister, the communist, was going to be the writer in the family. She had announced that and nobody ever dared argue with a Stalinist. And, uh, and, uh, and I was the cartoonist. And, but when these Hollywood writers got thrown in jail uh, because they had the wrong politics, and some of them, no doubt, were communists. Maybe all of them were communists, but that they got, they 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 had a means of taking a living away from them. I thought that was impossible, and I could not believe that anybody could defend that. And, and as I said, I don't know why that meant so much to me emotionally, because I identified in no way with that professionally, except I liked some of the movies, and some of them I thought were just terrible. Um, but. The blacklist always stayed in my mind, and when I when I was in the army in 1950s, I got out in 1953. The first one of the first things I did, and I write this in the introduction to the book, the ghost script, uh, was to go to see Jerome Robbins testify before the House on American Activities Committee in Foley Square, and he had the King and I on at the time on Broadway, and uh, first of all, I sat there and was horrified at just the um, below level and, and not so below level constant humiliation of Robbins who was there to be contrite, there to make amends, there to be allowed to name names so that he could shoot the movie of uh, the West Side Story because that's what it was all about, to get a job in the movies. That's why you sold out your friends. Uh, and, uh, and that's what he had decided that he had to do. And what the committee did is go through this round of, first of all, they, they asked him what he did. He's a director and a choreographer, a dance director and a choreographer. And, and by that time, at that point, the word choreographer was not part of the lexicon. It was not common. And so each of these committee members, whose words were being beamed by radio and, and, and TV to the Midwest and, and, the, and the Southwest where their homes were, for their home audiences, they had to show that this New York Jew fairy word choreographer was unfamiliar to them. So they went around, each one of them, you know, choreographer, and then the next guy, choreographer, what? And they had to show that they could not say choreographer, so that they could not, they would, they would not be complicit in Robin's guilt. And they, having done all of that, uh, they then just beat him up over and on finally at the end of it where he had named the names and done everything that they had agreed upon beforehand the chairman of the committee said mr robbins i uh, just want to thank you for your patriotic testimony i just want to say that my wife and i are going to see the king and i tonight and because of your patriotic testimony tonight here today uh i know we're going to enjoy your choreography that much more and robbins looked down and said thank you mr chairman and i thought this is impossible, and it, it it's it was this ritual of humiliation that anybody who lives lived old enough now to live through that have lived through that period remembers very well and happening over and over and over again, and it was that that I wanted to write about and comment about and talk about, and it's a very American part of what we do and have done in the past. We did it in the 1920s with, the, with, with uh, 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 and, and before that with anarchists, 
we did it in Chicago with the, uh, um, uh, after after the uh, uh, Haymarket riot. We've you know that that the, the wars we've always gone in for these periods of um, of actions that prompted you know whether anarchist explosions or assassinations or whatever that prompted wide scale. Uh, reprisal and deportation and imprisoning and and just you know massive and you know and we we are obviously going through the whole thing today but when i wrote this book and through most of the time i was illustrating it it was before the current uh well before any of the, any of the current uh, uh uh immigration stuff is happening at all it just it's just predictable that it's America. We've always done this. We always have done it. We always will do it because one thing Amer we seem to hate as, as much or more than any other country is learning any lessons from history. We dismiss history and have to do it always over again and over again and over again. And so we're doing, so that time that we're living through now is the time that I lived through in the 1950s and that went, went and was repeated with Sacco and Vincetti in the 1930s, or 20s rather, and and before that in the early 1900s. We just do it. It's what we do. Is there another question? Uh, I wondered if you had any uh, comment about the demise of the Village Voice. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, you know I, it's, uh, the, the, as far as I was concerned, the Voice stopped being the Voice many years ago. It was, in its time, the most alive, inventive, interesting wacky and whacked out paper you can imagine and it was a wonderful forum for me to work in and, and wonderful for me to read the the writers who i was a great fan of and and um, um and it meant a lot in the culture but what the vo the voice didn't die i mean the, the newspaper died many years before uh it officially died but the writers in the voice moved on with their sensibility and you Later saw them in the pages of Jim Bellows' Herald Tribune in the 1950s and, and, and 60s. And, 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 and later on after that in the pages of the New York Times. I mean, the style of writing in the New York Times has, has, has long ago, and in the Washington Post, long ago been affected by voice style. And, um, and what was best in, and, and more interesting uh, about the voice as it was back then has been picked up so much by newspapers across this country. It's been a huge influence, a huge unstated influence. So the voice that has that hasn't died. It's gone on living and affecting us in the in the prevailing culture and, and more power to it. So I don't mourn it. Another question. Hi, I got two questions actually. Um, one, I'm I'm wondering if you came to any. Uh, conclusions or elaborate thoughts about what was it that was bothering people in, after the World War II? And I ask you this because I remember quite what, distinctly. What, 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 what about people? What, you said why Excuse were me. why were people so unhappy in the period, sort of late fifties, I guess early sixties, maybe? And I ask you that because my mom here, I remember her asking that very question early nineteen. Well, why don't you speak for herself? And, <laughs> What's the matter with you, mom? It. She may not remember it. But and then the, the Pat other, got your tongue. The other question. <laughs> yes, she says. <laughs> <laughs> the other question is, what in your uh, your family was there any inspiration from your family for you to become to, to pick your career? Oh, uh, uh, oh, God! The question of family. I, <laughs> I, 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 here's what my family had to do with it. Don't go away. Don't run away. Stay up there and take this. <laughs> Take your medicine. Uh, that uh, my high school, James Monroe in the Bronx, uh, had for years when I went there, I and mean, long before I went there, they had a ceremony over the years where they honored three former graduates, uh, and they elevated them to the James Monroe High School Hall of Fame. And these three graduates would get up at a mass assembly of the school students, you know, every year, and explain why they were important and give and give benefit of their wisdom to all of us. 
and we would sit there writhing in pain <laughs> as these three people nobody ever heard of, uh, uh, most of whom hadn't been indicted yet, <laughs> but many would be, uh, in the public sphere or the private sphere, uh, told us very somberly and very seriously how we have to stick to the rules, obey our teachers, do this. And, and I kept sitting there listening and looking at them and looking for some sign that they had ever been a kid, <laughs> that they had ever thought, you know, what the, there was no sign that there was any youth ever in any of them. And I also thought of fantasize at the time. Someday I will be up there and I will tell the truth. <laughs> and then the day came. <laughs> <laughs> And on that day, my parents were in the audience, and my two sisters, uh, and I said, uh, the secret of my success is that uh, I always listened to the advice of my mother, and my mother gave me advice over the years to do this and do that, and I would follow that advice, and I'd fail. And she, and something else would come up, and she'd give me advice, and I'd follow that advice, and I'd fail. And then one day it occurred to me that maybe I should try something else. So I listened to advice. I did the up, exact opposite, and I became famous. <laughs> so I have, ne <laughs> so having never stopped listening to, to doing exactly the opposite of everything my mother suggested is what what I'm what I'm doing up here today and the entire student body got up and applauded and cheered and screamed <laughs> the teachers sat there grim and stony faced the principal was looking grim my parents were applauding my mother was applauding because look how nice they are to her boy and but that's that's what i learned from my mother how she was wrong about everything, even when she tried to be right. <laughs> um, and, yes, sir. And the What's that? And the spirit of the United States. Wait, wait, come, 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 come close to the microphone. Don't back the away. The first question, sort of why, why the sort of downward trend of, of uh, emotion in film um, after the war, when things well, well, were looking it, 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 up? Clearly... It's a wonderful question. As I say, that's a question that haunted me and, 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 and stirs the word. But I guess that through all of that, there were, we were coming, we had lived through so much of our lives pre-war and the Great Depression, you know, obsessed everybody. But so much of it was based on an American mythology, the American dream uh, everybody gets an opportunity. We ignored completely our racism. There was, I mean, you know, that that with all of the advances of the New Deal, none of them involved civil rights, because if it tried to involve civil rights, there would have been no coalition in the South. You know, the South was all democratic, and the only way you got laws passed was to you know to keep support segregation and racism, and. Uh, so there was no attempt to deal with what has basically been the key American problem, the key American dilemma since slavery or since our, you know, our creation. And uh, I mean, I recommend to you, if you haven't read them, the writings, the current writings of Tanahishi Coates, who writes at great length and quite brilliantly about all of this. And uh, so even when we seem to be addressing our problems, as we did during the Depression, there were so many other problems that we were brushing under the rug, and we've always brushed stuff under the rug. We'll deal with that later. We'll deal with that later. We'll deal with that later. And after the war, all the things that we didn't deal with started popping to the surface. And you settle one and something else pops. And all the contradictions began popping. And it's those contradictions that basically led to me and my work because I, too, was as puzzled as anyone else was. And I, too, was a believer in the American dream. And, 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 and I, too, had 
thoughts that all we had to do was fix a little here and fix a little there. And um, and I, too, was subject to things blowing up in my face just as I thought it was getting better, as it does to this very moment, except it's all blown up in all of our faces. Uh, because how can you get along with a mythology that has been lying about itself from day one? So there we are. Now, aren't you sorry you asked that question? No, I'm very <laughs> glad I did. That's a fascinating answer. Thank you. Did you draw any inspiration from any real-life movie stars or filmmakers of the well, time? Well, in, 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 um, in the ghost script, there's an actress, there's a, a star, uh, has been over the hill, Stalin named Lola Burns. Lola Burns was Gene Harlow's name in a movie called Reckless. There were all these little, uh, great naughtiness and fun was had by me, dropping clues all through all three books that just had to do with my own private obsessions here and there. So, <laughs> and, and it may or may not mean anything. But there are a number of things like that in, 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 in the books. Uh, I can think of a couple, I can't think of anything right now as soon as I get off, I'll think of three or four more. But they're all they're they're all over. This. In this current book, I I have my character one of my characters talk about reading the spirit when he was a kid, and uh, and that was a lot of fun. He, I'll, I'll read that to you because I he, he, the spirit meant so much to me, and Eisner and his work meant so much to me that I thought it was my way of paying him back. Uh, let's see, my hero. Archie Goldman is a private detective and a loser private detective, and he always gets beat up. He can never win a fight. And here he is after a series of assaults where he is sitting there ruminating, and 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 like a you know and and like a drunken and a noir film, he's sitting there you know thinking about life, and he says, "I used to read the Sunday comics about this mass crime fighter, the spirit." who almost every week got into fights where he got the crap pounded out of him. Terrible beatings. Until at the very last minute, with his last shred of strength, he'd win the fight. And I'd read The Spirit, and I'd think, was it worth it? I've never been any good at fighting. But out of nowhere, I punch out a hopeless drunk because my mother got strangled. And the goon who strangled him, who's 30 years older than me, he beats me up until he drops out of a heart attack. So, did I win that one? Do I know the difference between losing and winning? Can you live your life without knowing the difference? Is that something important to know? So I take something that, you know, that, that was a staple in every spirit reader's memory of how much punishment, physical punishment, the spirit endured. He, you know, he, he got beaten up in more fights than he won until he finally won with a lucky punch or something like that. And, uh, and was able to use it in my in, in my kind of salute to him, because uh, as I was doing this last book, uh, the importance of Eisner in my work, the importance of Eisner in the bend of my the tilt of my career, uh, how I ended up where I have ended up, is 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 totally connected to him and couldn't have happened without him looking over my shoulder and and I and um, and so the book was you know unintentionally but more and more a, a, a salute to he who had so meant who meant so much to me uh, through my childhood and more importantly in my later life like you know up to the minute right now Can we take a few more questions before I Collapse. Yeah. Um, yeah. As you've grown older, have you developed a dance to September or a dance to autumn or winter? Uh, uh, it's it's what, what do you want? How has it changed? Yes. Have you have you evolved in, in the sense of the dance as you've grown much more mature? No, well, I, I, I uh, last um, I'm tired, so I don't remember exactly what month. I think I think it was last fall. Oh, no, uh, April. Last April. In Northampton, Massachusetts, there's a wonderful art gallery, the Rich Michelson Gallery, and he gave me a huge show uh, 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 last April, and it's got a hundred dancers in it, uh, and and they're all new. They were done over the past year and a half or so, and uh, and a lot of 
male dancers, a lot of Fred Astaire's, a lot of black dancers, a lot of fat dancers, skinny dancers, women dancers, a lot of my modern dancers. I re I redrew entirely my dance this spring in separate panels that were much bigger. And uh, I had a lot of fun with all of it. And it was a terrific exhibition. And go on up there. You can see it now. So, sure. I, you know, that, that uh, over uh, a stare, in, you know, the, the modern dancer came into being because when I got my first apartment in New York, when I was in, doing stuff for the Village Voice, the first woman, young woman, to come home and sleep with me was a modern dancer. <laughs> Uh, her name was Judy, Judy Goldstone, and, and who later became Judith Dunn, a very influential dancer down at, uh, uh, in the village. And uh, so you don't forget that, and she was very proud of that, <laughs> that, that, that she, was, she was the dancer. She was the original dancer. And I began as an alternate doing Fred Astaire dancers in, in, in drawings and in strips, occasional strips. Because more than anyone else, a single figure, what Astaire represented to me in how he worked was how I wanted to work. Will you never show the effort? Will you never show how hard you're working? How you, you work very hard to make it look easy, to make it look effortless, to make it look as if who me, what? I'm not doing anything. The difference between Gene Kelly, who was a great dancer, was that he was always showing off and he wanted you to see how hard he was working. And he wanted the applause. And you get the feeling of Stair was always embarrassed by the applause. He just wanted to do, he was doing it because that's what he did. And that's what the work means to me. I, I do it because it's what I do and what I love doing. And I do it, I go on doing it because there's nothing else I know how or care to know how to do. And on that note, I will thank you all. Oh. But Ginger Rogers did it backwards. That's not my... Well, you, my stole, you stole that from Arlene Crochet. No, I mean, but that's not what my comment was going to be. So no more questions, Jules? Oh, you want, you, want, you want a question? Yeah. So when I was making the film on Gertrude Berg, who had this incredible Molly show... Molly Goldberg. Molly Goldberg. She was the mother of the year. Her stage husband, Philip Loeb, was the father of the year, recognized by the Boy Scouts. And then the blacklist happened. He got blacklisted. Yeah. I mean, the fall from grace was horrible. And I'm just And did he die? He killed himself. He was, killed himself. Yes. She fought very hard to keep him on the show. It's all depicted in a film I made, You Who, Mrs. Goldberg. Yeah. Uh, and I remember as a young child, the first time my dad was yelling was at the TV during the McCarthy hearings. And then, of course, the famous expression, have you no decency? I mean, when are we going to have that be the turn of events in this country? Well, I think my, uh, my prediction, you know, I've spent a long lifetime in this game, and I've yet to be right about anything. But... <laughs> Nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, my prediction is Donald Trump will be history in about three months. Yep. Uh, From your not, beca not because of what the American people do, but what, what the courts will do. Yeah. You know, we got too much on him. He knows it. And um, but that's the only that's the only beginning of this. What we've got is the most corrupt Congress we have ever had and the most consciousless Congress. We got a Republican Party that should be taken out and marched away. Uh, and and, and the, the cynicism that pervades our entire system from top to bottom makes Trump seem almost innocent because he, the schmuck, is just trying to steal money. <laughs> he doesn't... <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but they, they're through... The, they, they, they're, 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 they're lying down for him because they can name some federal judges and go, and go on doing their bad things. They're the real criminals in all of this. And that's where the fight has to be. But we have a younger generation coming up who seem to know that. So, so don't lose hope. All right. You, you, you have a, I've already said goodbye, and you have a question. Yeah. Would you like to say a word about the three people that you've dedicated the book to? Oh, that's very lovely. The, the, the book is dedicated to, uh, and I've been wanting to do this for a long time, to I have Stone, who I assume most of you know. 
to Murray Kempton, who I've seen many of you know because you know, uh, and and uh, when 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 years ago I used to say that uh, my marks and Kempton were I have stone and Murray Kempton. I mean, my, my marks and Lennon were I have stone and Murray Kempton. They taught me more about how to think and how to think politically than anybody else I knew. And the third name was Leonard Boudin, the great constitutional lawyer, who was also a friend of mine, um, who was an extraordinary man, a sweet, lovable fellow, who threw wonderful parties at his house at 12 and a half at St. Luke's Place in New York, where he just moved from group to group, agitating everybody and trying to start fights with everyone, with, you know, but all good humored, but he was always contrary and who got killed by his daughter, who uh, was responsible for his early death by, because her father she didn't think was radical enough, so she decided to take part in a, rab a robbery and, 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 and drive the car that killed the cop. And he, in her bringing down his entire house, just gave up on life, and, and she shortened it, I'm convinced. And uh, that's the crime here. That's so that's why that's what the dedication is about.